Welcome to the study of God's Word with pastor and author Ed Taylor, recorded live from Calvary Chapel in Aurora, Colorado. To learn more about the many resources available through Abounding Grace Media, visit us online at calvaryaurora.org or download our free app on all platforms. And now, here's Pastor Ed to take us into our study. Amen. Take your Bibles and open them to 2 Kings chapter 6 as we continue our study verse by verse through the book of 2 Kings. And you'll recall the last time we were together after miraculously retrieving that, last, that lost axe head, Elisha is used again in the life of the king of Israel. You know, Elisha was a good man to have around. If you were interested in truth, and you were interested in the leading of God, then Elisha would have been a man you wanted to hang out with. Because isn't it true, and haven't you found it to be true personally, that what the Bible says, evil company corrupts good habits. You, You can spend a lifetime of obedience and developing good habits, and they can be lost in a short amount of time by hanging out with the wrong people, by being at the wrong places, by doing the wrong things. It's true for all of us. And when you find yourself hanging out with the wrong people in the wrong places doing the wrong things, you have a tendency at the same time to push people like Elisha out of your life because you get tired of hearing the truth and you get tired of having to deal with a man that has no compromise in his life. And just being around a man with no compromise brings conviction into your life. And so you tire of the conviction and you begin to find people that agree with you a little bit more or don't speak the word of God into you as much or don't confront you or don't pray for you or don't give you some kind of direction. But we need people like Elisha in our lives and we need to be people like Elisha. We, as we see his example, want to be the kind of man that says, Elijah, what I've seen in your life is wonderful, but I want a double portion. I want to experience more than what I've seen in your life. I want to experience more of the work of God, not less. I want to experience more open doors. I want to experience more miracles. I want to experience more help. And Elisha is a good man to have around if you like truth and the leading of God. If you don't like the truth, then you won't like Elisha. And if you don't like the truth, then you won't like the Bible. And if you don't like the truth, then you'll find yourself surrounded with people that don't like the truth as well. And it's a really a bummer at times when people aren't liked simply because they're a man or a woman of God. Because you'll find that in your life that the closer you get to Jesus, the more things get sorted out in your lives. The more you find as you're perceived as an Elisha, not everybody likes Elishas in their lives. Not everybody wants a man of truth or a woman of truth. And it's good to be the kind of people that God will use in these last days no matter what the cost is because if, you, if, you really, if it really comes down to it, Elisha was God's servant. We use this phrase so frequently that I think it's lost its meaning. And I want to remind us, even though we'll use it many times, probably many times in our study today, he was a man of God. He was a man of God. He wasn't a man of the world. He wasn't a man of popularity. He wasn't a man of popular opinion. He was a man of God. He was a man devoted and dedicated to doing the things of God. He was a man that was devoted and dedicated to saying the words of God and to speak truth into situation. And we're reminded, now I know we're in 2 Kings. Hold your, hand, hold your place there. Go over to Jeremiah chapter 18. Because Elisha was God's servant. He was God's instrument. He was to be used of God as God saw fit. And we're given an illustration in Jeremiah chapter 18 of God as the potter. And the potter was sitting there at the potter's wheel working something in the clay. And so here's the illustration. The potter in this scripture is a picture of God. And the clay is a picture of 
people, you, in the potter's hand. And the wheel is a representative of life. And life can be like the potter's wheel, can it? <laughs> it can spin and spin. It can take off and it can slow down. And, and life can just be spinning around, spinning around. And you're like, well, slow down, Lord. Slow down. But notice with me, Jeremiah chapter 18. Pick up in verse 1. A familiar passage, of course, but such a great one to be reminded of. The word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Arise and go down to the potter's house, and I'll cause you to hear my words. Then I went down to the potter's house, and there he was, making something at the wheel. And the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter, so he made it again into another vessel as it seemed good to the potter to make. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, O house of Israel, can I not do with you as this potter, says the Lord? Look as the clay is in the potter's hands, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. And so Jeremiah, in the midst of his serving and his ministry to a resistant, rebellious nation, is told to go down to this potter's house. And God is going to show him something. And he's going to hear something. And there is, there is in the potter's house, he notices the care and concern of the potter. He, he notices how the potter is making something very specific. Now, this would be a little scary as we look at this picture in light of our lives. If we didn't know the character of God, if we didn't understand who God was, that God is holy and loving and righteous, that he's faithful and sacrificial, the Bible says in Psalm 25, verse 10, that the paths of the Lord, all the paths of the Lord, are mercy and truth. Psalm 19, 9 says, The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever, and the judgments of God are true and righteous altogether. In Psalm 119, it says, verse 76, Let, I pray, your merciful kindness be for my comfort, according to your word of your servant, because God is love. We don't have to be afraid of the work of God in our lives. We don't have to be afraid of the spinning wheel and the pressure of the potter's hands when we begin to see what he's creating in us and it's not what we expected. God is in charge and he will and can do what he wants. The best response for us is to participate. And I like the word participate because everyone's like, yeah, I'll participate. The Bible word for participate is obey. The Bible word for participate is submit. But it sounds nicer when you say participate. You get an amen on that? Sure, I could part. I'll even get a participation award. Okay. Then let's let that be the obedience award and the submission award of all that God is doing in our lives. As you feel the potter, as he puts his hands into your life and he molds this and he shapes this and he's spinning around and spinning around and he's getting to the point where then finally he says in verse 4 that the clay was marred. It was broken. It was crushed. It's always a devastating time to experience the marring of life, to experience the difficulties of life to experience the failures of life, the disappointments of life. There isn't any one of us that haven't experienced being marred, having to face conflict and hurt and pain. But therein lies the choice. Because as we all assent with our hearts and our minds to being marred, we may not read the rest of the verse, and we must read the rest of the verse. Because it says, and don't miss this, you might need to circle this, you might need to underline it, put a star next to it, however you want, but the vessel that he made, your life and mine, the clay is us, he's making a vessel, he's developing us, making us into who he wants, into the image of Christ, but in the process, he, we were, the clay was marred where? In the hand of the potter. Everything's in the hand of the potter the good, the bad, the nice, the mean, the pretty, the ugly, the, the good words, the bad words. Everything is in the hand of the potter in our lives. And, and we look at the marring of our lives and we say, oh God, we're ruined. 
It's over. It's done. And yet, not only it we've marred in the potter's hand, but what does the rest of the verse say? So he made it again into another vessel, as it seemed good for the potter to make. None of us is finished yet. The wheel's still spinning. Do you hear my voice? Yes or no? Wheel's still spinning. Are you still breathing? Wheel's still spinning. Even you guys that are asleep on me right now, when you wake up, we're going to tell you that the wheel's still spinning. On the unemployment line, the wheel's still spinning. At the mortuary, the wheel's still spinning. In the courthouse, wheel's still spinning. In the basement, in the car, wherever you may be today, the wheel's still spinning and you're still in the potter's hands. And he's ready to make you again into a new vessel. Now, of course, if you're here today and you don't have a relationship with God, life's scary because you're not in the potter's hands. You can't just open the Bible. You can't just kind of live your own life and do your own thing and curse God and turn against God and speak all things against God. And then when times get tough, you open the Bible. Oh, this is so encouraging to me. This is so wonderful to me. I just, I'm so, no, no, no. It's a relationship that gets you the encouragement. It's the relationship and the, the, the surrender and saying, no, God, I have been doing my own thing and I've marred my own life and I've done, I've done the things that I've wanted to do and you have to come to the conclusion that you have failed. You have sinned against a holy and a righteous God and he has provided for you the forgiveness of your sin if you will come to Jesus Christ and you will accept him into your life and live for him and not for yourself. Then this can encourage you. Until then... It's not an encouraging passage to those that have no relationship to the potter. God is still at work for you and me, but he wants us to be moldable and soft. He wants us to focus on the hand of the potter, not on the mar of our clay, of our lives. Because if a person has a response to the marring in their life with a stubborn and a hard heart, and they resist God's touch, then God has a right that he will exercise to deal with that stiff clay, to do what it takes to soften soften it up and remove the stubbornness. And so don't resist him. The Bible says in Micah chapter 6, verse 8, he has shown you, O man, what is good and what does the Lord require of you but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Come back to 2 Kings now because Elisha is the man that God is fashioning. Just like you're the man that God is fashioning. You're the woman that God is fashioning. You're the boy that God is fashioning. You're the girl. You're the husband. You're the wife. You're the single. You're the divorcee. You're the widower. You are the one that God is fashioning. And you're in the potter's clay. No, you're in the potter's hand. You're the clay. You are in and I am in the potter's hand on the potter's wheel so that what he does with us is what pleases him. And let me tell you something. The closer you are in your relationship with God, the more you learn that what pleases God pleases you. Because you may respond to say, wait a minute. Why is my only my life meant to please God? Well, because when you are deeper in relationship with someone, you come to find out that what pleases them pleases you. As a matter of fact, the deeper you get into relationship, you begin to only think about how to please someone else and not yourself. And so when God is doing something that pleases him, it also will please you and encourage you, even through the marring and the breaking and the tearing. And this is the man that God is fashioning We've been studying him now in verse 8 of chapter 6, another episode of Elisha. Now the king of Syria was making war against Israel, and he took counsel with his servants, saying, My camp will be in such and such a place. And the man of God sent to the king of Israel, saying, Beware that you do not pass this place, for the Syrians are coming down there. And the king of Israel sent someone to the place of which the man of God had told him, and thus he warned him, And he was a watchful there, not once or twice, not just once or twice. Verse 11. 
Therefore the heart of the king of Syria was greatly troubled by this thing, and he called his servants and said to them, Will you not show me which of us is for the king of Israel? You know, he's like, is there a, a mole here? How does he know everything? And then the answer, you got to chuckle at this, the, the sense of humor of God. I love it. One of his servants said, None of my Lord, O king, but Elisha the prophet who's in Israel tells the king the words that you speak in your bedroom. <laughs> Once again, God gives Elisha insight. And it's very detailed. This time it was on the ambushes that were set up in this war. Syria going after Israel. Going to set some ambushes up and God gives Elisha direct insight of all these ambushes. And many times Elisha saves the king of Israel from these ambushes. It says not just once or twice. God is using him in their lives. And in verse 12, the answer, for Eli the answer was there's no traitor among us, king of Syria. It's that guy Elisha. He knows even what's going on in the privacy of your own bedroom. He, he, there isn't anywhere you can leave. You, can, you can't get anywhere away from Elisha and really the God of Elisha because he knows everything. You can't hide anything from him. And it was the intimacy that he had with God. He was surprised and shocked that God didn't reveal things to him. Remember, we looked at this before. I, I'm always amazed and shocked when God does reveal things to me, when he does give me insight. You know, we, uh, recently a situation happened in my life as a pastor, as a leader, and I was shocked by it. I didn't know about it. And you know, when you get like that, you, don't you feel, don't, isn't the next feeling, man, I should have known about that. Why didn't I know about that? Why did it come as such a great surprise? Well, that's Ed not Elisha, because Elisha knew stuff that was going on in the privacy. He knew things. He didn't respond to things. God showed him things, and it just encourages me because I want God to show me things. I don't want to be so shocked, and, and I wasn't shocked because of sin in my life or anything. I wasn't walking. It's just God chose not to reveal it to me. It was part of his plan of fashioning and molding me that I would be shocked by this. It would surprise me, and I would have to go to the Lord with that shock and surprise and ask him, well, now what are you doing? Why did you allow it this way? You know I want to know, Lord. You know I want to be a good leader. You know I want to get a heads up. You know, and the Lord's going, well, I've got a lot more for you to know, son. And I submit to him. Notice verse 13. So he said, go and see where he is, that I may send and get him. And it was told him, saying, surely he's in Dothan. Therefore he sent horses and chariots and a great army there. And they came by night and surrounded the city. How many people are they going to get? One. And who does he send? A great army and horses and chariots. He sent the army. It, it, you know, the equivalent of today, you guys of course know this, it would be like sending tanks and a great army to go get this guy. This guy, Elisha. And we know someone was with him, it says in verse 15, when the servant of the man of God arose early and went out, there was an army surrounding the city with horses and chariots. And his servant said to him, Alas, my master, what shall we do? And he answered, Do not fear, for those that are with us are more than those who are with them. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray, open his eyes that he may see. And then the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. So impactful was Elisha's ministry that an army was sent to get him. And that's a pretty scary thing to face. If a, an army was sent to go get you, it's just like, oh, I'm, take me. And that would be a scary thing to experience. And Elisha's servant is with him, and he sees the army coming for them. And I see his, his answer in verse 15 is he panicked. Now, let me just ask you, don't you think you would panic, yes or no? I hope you'd say yes, and none of you, oh, no, I'll take on the arm. No, no, come on now. Like, you're just, you're with the man of, of God. You're seeing all kinds of crazy miracles. It's kind of fun. And now an army's coming after you. And he looks out at them, and what does he see? He sees the army. That's what he sees. With his physical eyes, he sees the army. If you and I were with Elisha, and we looked out, you know what we would see? An army. That's what we would see. 
and we would respond accordingly. I don't know to what degree we'd be afraid or panicking, but we respond accordingly, and that's what the word alas, it's, it's, a, it's a strong word. We're in trouble. It's over. It's done. What shall we do? What is it that we do in those times? Because listen, church, there are those times in all of our lives when we think it's over, when all is lost. We are done. Forget about it. In the short time that I've walked with Jesus Christ, I can think of many, many times where I've come to that very conclusion in my walk with Jesus Christ. It's over. There's no hope for this situation. And someone might be sent into my life to speak a word of encouragement or speak a word of perspective, and I have an answer for everything. They say, no, you don't understand, and you don't get this, and you haven't seen this, and you don't... And, and just responding to crisis, we can easily see the army and panic and give up because there are always those times in our lives. You might have experienced one today. You might be in the middle of one of weeks or months. And it just looks like everything's against you. Everyone's against you. And there's no way out. There's no escape. A careful study of the scriptures will lead you to see that this has happened to many of the men and women of God. I mean, how can we not remember Moses leading the nation of Israel out of Egypt into what was seemingly a trap? <laughs> no way out. The Red Sea before them, hills and mountains on, behind, on the sides of them, the Egyptian army behind them. What? Where do we go? And you see over and over again, the reality of facing difficulties in life. Someone comes to try to help and counsel you, but you quickly see and say, look, you're crazy, it's over. What do we do? What's, what are we supposed to do? And what Elisha says in verse 16 is, do not fear. He speaks directly to the part of his flesh that's causing him to panic, to the part of his humanity. Don't fear, because those that are with us are more than those who are with them which would lead me to believe, I think if I was the servant, I'd look around and going, who are you talking about? It's you and me, bro. I mean, I don't know, how are you hiding? And, and I would be assessing it. Army, Elisha. Army, Elisha. Like, well, who else? And looking, I mean, it's like... But Elisha is that steady... And you notice, well, who is, what is he called? He's a man of God. He's a man of God. You men are men of God. You women are women of God. He is your protector. And what we learn here is that even though what we see and feel and assess is real, it's not the whole story. Because in this case, we learn for men and women of God, there is an unseen realm all around us that is just as real as the seen. There is an unseen realm, which is the spiritual, and there is the seen realm that is the physical. Unfortunately, the physical gets all our attention and focus, sometimes too much. Too much time in front of the mirror, too much time planning this, too much, too much time on the physical. You get an email, physical. A phone call, physical. A thought, physical. A reminder, it's all, it's, it's, we live in the physical. And yet, we also live in the spiritual. And it's easy to lose sight of the spiritual because of the physical. Because of what we're experiencing. Because of what's before us. Because there's an army coming. It's easy to see the army and forget the spiritual. It, it's easy to get lost in the realities of life and forget that the realities that we are currently facing is not all that there is in reality. There is a spiritual realm. And we have to train ourselves to be sensitive to see the spiritual. That's really the key to not losing heart and not panicking, is to remember the spiritual. 
Jot this down. Let me read it to you in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, in verse 16. Paul is writing to the church in Corinth, and he says, Therefore, we do not lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing. That's the physical. Outward man is perishing. But our inward man is being renewed day by day. That's the spiritual. Now, what gets most of our attention? The physical. It demands our attention. It sometimes it speaks its own language to us with noises and cracks and moans and pains and aches that just get all of our attention. And if we're not careful, we'll forget that there's an inward man and an inward woman of you that is not getting worse and worse, but is getting better and better, closer and closer. It's being renewed day by day. He says our light affliction, is that physical or spiritual? Say it out loud. We're a, this is a quiz because I'm going to give you a grade before you leave. So our light affliction, physical or spiritual? It's physical. It's just for a moment. It's working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory, physical or spiritual? Spiritual. If you start reading the Bible like that, you begin to see that the both realms coexist at the same time. While we don't look at the things that are seen, physical or spiritual? No, I lost you. We're going to start over, and I'm not going to ask you physical or spiritual. I'm just going to pause, and you're going to yell it to me. Okay? You ready? And I've got the cameras all set up. Hold on a second. We're going to do the retina scans. That's how we're going to grade you. We're going to send you the grades. And if you don't pass, you're staying all night for study hall. Okay? So I'm going to pause. You're going to tell me physical or spiritual. And you're going to say it loud enough where the people listening on the radio can hear you. Okay? Therefore, we do not lose heart. Even though our outward man is perishing... Yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we do not look at the things that are seen, but the things that are not seen, for the things that are temporary. I said that wrong. I got a B. Man, I wanted an A so bad. Here's the last one. For the things that are seen are temporary, but the things that are not seen are eternal. Do you see it all comes together? A, 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 instructor, C minus. <laughs> In 2 Corinthians 5, verse 6, it says, so we're always confident that even though we know that as long as we live in these bodies, we're not at home with the Lord. That's why we live by believing and not seeing. Or in the, old, in the New King James, we live by faith, not by sight. I read to you from the New Living because I like hearing it in a different way to make our minds engage. That's why we live by believing, not by seeing. Love that. Sadly, living as we do in this material world, we get so involved in the physical, material things of life, and that's all we ever see. We lose sight of the spiritual. We lose sight of God. We get so concerned about the opposition that's facing us, the power of the enemy, especially when, it, when we begin to fight the forces of the world, how hard it is, how hopeless it seems, the wave of the culture, even the wave of the culture of the church, and where are the godly men, and where are the godly women, and where are the godly families raising the next generation? Where are those that are taking a stand for the unborn? Where are those taking a stand for righteousness? Where are those that care more about the Lord than they do about politics? Where are they? And if that's all you focus on, it can discourage you because you don't see everything. You don't know everything. And we're like this servant so many times. Alas, what are we going to do? And we falsely conclude almost every day, oh, there's no way we can withstand them. It's so easy to forget these truths, but they're ours. Listen to this truth. You are of God, little children. You are of God, little children, and have overcome them because he that is in you is greater than he who is in the world. 1 John 4, 4. We forget that. Romans chapter 8, verse 31. What can we say about these wonderful things? If God is for us, who can ever be against us? And since God did not spare even his own son, but gave him up for us all, won't God, who gave us Christ, also give us everything else? 
And we panic and we freak out when we see the enemies, when we face our difficulties. And as I learned recently from Pastor Chuck Smith in a Bible study about the faithfulness of God, this will stick with me until heaven. He said, the longer we look at our problem, the bigger it gets. The longer we look at our problem, the bigger it gets. So big that I don't even see or feel God anymore. Our problems can become so big that they block out the faithfulness of God in our lives. Why? Because all we've done is think about them and mold them and make them and woe is me and and we just focus on them and we lose sight of the faithfulness of God. We're like Elisha's servant here. It's over and there's nothing we can do. And so we ask, along with Elisha as he prayed, Oh Lord, would you open our eyes that we might see the spiritual? Would you open our eyes as Elijah prayed, that we, Elisha prayed, that our eyes would see what we don't normally see? And I pray that in every situation that we're in, we would not only see the problems around us, but also the solutions. That when the eyes of our servant are open, that we could see the spiritual things going on behind the scenes. That he saw the angels of the Lord were surrounding the Syrians, the horses, the chariots. And this is from a man that was so close to Elisha. This is the man that understood that Elisha knew what was happening in the king of Syria's bedroom. How much confidence would that give you to hang out with the guy that is calling out all the ambushes of the enemy? How would, how would it make you feel to hang out with a guy that always hears from the Lord? It would encourage me. I mean, I'd want to be with that. Hey, what's God doing today? Well, such and such and so and so. And every day he's right. Hey, man, the guy lost his accent over there. Don't worry about it. Where did, he, where did you drop it? And miraculously, it pops up. And yet, so close to a man that's so close to God, so quickly loses heart. Isn't that what happens to you? So close, so strong, and yet so quick to lose heart. They're spiritual. There's a spiritual world all around us. And as we've learned in our studies through Hebrews, the angelic realm is both powerful and numerous. And they are God's servants to serve you. And what does he get to see? These angels. These surrounding power of God, of the horses and chariots of fire, the power of God to come and descend upon this place. What a difference it made in his outlook. You know, when we only look at the material things, so often you say, we've had it. But when God opens your eyes and you see the spiritual dimension, it changes completely. It's not like, it's no longer, I've had it. When you see the spiritual realm, you say, you've had it. You're done. Isn't that the case if you were there on the sidelines watching that whole episode go down in the Valley of Elah? And you're like, what are you talking about? Valley of Elah, what are you talking about? Well, in Valley of Elah, something very important happened. And if you have the opportunity to go to Israel with us, we're going to go right to the Valley of Elah. And in the Valley of Elah is where that great episode happened bet- between a kid and a giant, David and Goliath. And let's just say we bought a ticket to watch it. And it didn't happen in the Valley of Elah, but it happened over in the stadium that has no name off of I-25. We don't know what the name of it is yet. But there's a stadium there, and we all bought a ticket, and that's the show. We know what's going to happen. David, the run, munchkin kid, the kid that's so small you can barely see him, and the giant. And uh, we're not a betting people, but if we were a betting people, we're putting all our money on who? The giant. The giant. Because when you see it, what do you think? When you're only looking at the physical, oh, poor kid. Poor kid. Honey, what do you think? Poor kid. And then there's the chant, poor kid, poor kid, poor kid. And they know the wave, poor kid, poor kid. Goliath, Goliath. You know, you can see it happening. That's, that's all the physical. That's all the physical. If you didn't know the full story of David and Goliath, and you read it word for word in real time like you're living it, believe me, believe me, you'd be tempted to put your money on Goliath, to put your confidence in Goliath. Because physically he had all the benefits. 
Physically, he had everything going for him. Physically, it was going, it, poor kid. And yet, from the spiritual side, that's the world's perspective, poor kid. But from God's perspective, it's actually poor giant. You're going to have a serious headache in just a few moments, giant. One that will end your life. You're going to lose your head. You're going to lose the battle. Because it wasn't David against Goliath. It was David and God against Goliath. And when God is with you, who can really prevail against you? And you know what happens? We hear that, and some of you are arguing with me right now. You're saying, Ed, I'll tell you a few things that have prevailed against God. This has happened to me. This is happening to me. This is what I feel right now. This is where I'm at right now. But here's the problem. The wheel's still spinning. The wheel's still spinning. Story's not done. There's still a few pages to be written in your life. You don't know what they are yet, but I can tell you how it's going to end. You're going to be in the presence of Jesus Christ. Every victory that you've ever wanted will be yours. Every tear will be wiped away. You're going to enter into the presence of your Lord, and he's going to say, well done, good and faithful servant. And even as I say that, Some of you are arguing with that. You go, I don't think I'm going to hear that. Even Billy Graham that. I know at times I feel like that. I don't know if I'm going to hear it. But I believe that God in his grace is going to say that to every true believer. It's not going to be our merits and our obedience. You're not going to fight to the head of the line. I was more obedient than you, Ed. I know. Go ahead. And then you just, this big wind from God, he blows you right back. Because everybody's in the same boat. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And the only reason we would ever be in the presence of Jesus Christ is because of his grace and his mercy and his goodness in our lives. Not because we deserve it. What is it for you? As I teach this Bible study, it's real time in my life. And so perhaps I'm the only one arguing sometimes with the text in my life. But this is real time. I could write down a few things that seem so large and insurmountable in my life that I say, poor Ed. Poor Ed. Odds are against you, man. You're not going to get through this. And yet, that's only the physical. Because the spiritual is, is poor enemy. Poor opposition. Poor mountain. Poor conflict. Poor whatever it might be that has come against you. No weapon formed against you shall stand, the Bible says. You will make it through. It's not we've had it, but when your spiritual eyes are open, it's they've had it, as the wheel is still spinning. And oh, that we would see the power of God tonight, church, the powers that God have made available to us, the resources that are ours in the realm of the Spirit, that we would not settle for the flesh life, that we would not settle for a hybrid Christianity or what we believe to be a hybrid Christianity where it's mostly us and a little bit of God and it's mostly us and we just baptize things with, with scriptures and it's mostly us and we darken the doors of a church every now and again and it's mostly us and we have our presets to K-Love and Grace FM and Care and that's it's mostly us but sometimes I listen to Christian radio You see, God has that little hunger in your life so that you'll go more and you'll go deeper and you'll go farther and you won't live at the low level of the flesh life, but that you will rise above your flesh and live in the Spirit and enjoy the presence of the Holy Spirit and enjoy His abiding life and the rest that's promised to you. See, even as the servant Elisha lacked faith here, he was still up early surveying the situation. (laughs) Let's give the boy some credit. Ah, He was scared, but he was up. At least he opened his eyes to see. At least he was checking out what the noise was, looking out for Elisha. I give him an amen for that. I give him props. That's one of the guys I'd like to meet. I want to, hey, dude, what was it like to hang out with Elisha? It looks, as we were reading it, it seems pretty crazy. Oh, you won't believe how crazy it was. And I said, I give you props, bro, for getting up in the morning and checking out who's coming. I know you got scared, but man, I can't tell you how many times I got scared by what I saw or what I heard. 
what feelings was stirred up by some situation that I have no control over. When will we learn we have no control over any situation? It's the potter fashioning. You're not fashioning me. I'm not fashioning you. You're not a disciple of Ed Taylor. You're a disciple of Jesus Christ. He's the one doing the work in your life. I'm just one of his thumbs or his fingers in your life as he's fashioning you and molding you. And, and God is doing a great work. I'm so grateful he got up because when he got up, he saw the enemies. At least he saw the enemies. At least he cried for help. Many people don't get up. Many people don't even see the enemy. God can and God will use you no matter what levels of faith you have. Just get up. Get moving. Get back in the game. Get back in the seeking God. Get back to the diligence and the dedication. Just get back in the game. And looking back, isn't God so faithful and true? Isn't he faithful? What about that problem you had 10 years ago? And you're like, what problem? Because we forget about a lot of them. And then we look back and go, wait a minute, God is so good. He's so faithful. God came through. Let me show you something. I've been meditating. I've been listening to the same Bible study over and over again. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to post this Bible study on social media tonight when I get home, if you want to listen to it. It's a Bible study in 1 Samuel chapter 7, and I'll, I'll put it on when I get home, or maybe a little bit later. Turn over to 1 Samuel. It's a Bible study by Pastor Chuck, and it's a topical study on, the, on this Ebenezer stone. And I just, it, it has been so encouraging to me. I just keep going back to it and keep, I've probably listened to this study three or four times now. It's just been ministering to my heart in this season of my life. And I want to draw your attention to verse 1 Samuel Verse, chapter 7, verse 12. And this is, we've studied this, so I've also taught on it too. I wonder if of what I taught was similar to what Pastor Chuck taught, so I'm going to go back and listen to it myself and see. I, you know, Chuck did such a better job than me, so I know that already. But I wonder what the Lord was speaking to me when I was teaching this text. So, so here he says in verse 12, Samuel took a stone and he set it up between Mizpah and Shen and he called its name, what does your Bible say? Ebenezer. You can circle that word, and next to it you can write stone of help. And Ebenezer, it's a stone of help. And he set up a stone there. And he said this, Thus far the Lord has helped us. Isn't that encouraging? Thus far the Lord has helped us. So what does Pastor Chuck do? He says, he takes you back and he says, Look, all the way up to, the, to this point in the past, God has been faithful, hasn't he? And then God has been faithful in the present, hasn't he? And then he ends his third point of the message is, if God has been faithful in the past and God is faithful right now, then understand God hasn't brought you this far just to dump you off and let you go. He's going to take you all the way in. He's going to complete what he started in you. He's going to perfect that which concerns you. And so how do, we get, how do we gain encouragement of what God's doing right now and what's happening in our life right now and whatever the future might be? Well, we look backwards and we go, man, the Lord has brought us this far. Ebenezer Stone. And then you take a few more steps. You go, oh man, the Lord, the stone was intended to be a memorial and a remembrance of the faithfulness of God. We need to start setting up Ebenezer stones in our lives so that we can remember and recall the faithfulness of God and it will be visual. And the kids will say, what's this stone in the middle of the table? Hey, it, God has been faithful thus far. He's the God of help. And that's a stone of help, son. Well, why are they like, why is our whole living room a stone garden? Why is the couch outside, Dad? Because, son, I just want you to know that God has been faithful up until this point. He's been faithful. And because he's been faithful in the past, and he's faithful now, God has brought us thus far, he's going to be faithful in the future. And so... You want to hang around with guys like Elisha. You want men to speak the truth into your life. You want a guy like Samuel to get a stone and set it there and go, look, every time you see this stone, you remember God has been faithful. Build a house out of him if you have to. Because if we look long enough and far enough, we're going to find that God has been faithful every step of the way. And so, Father, as we turn our hearts and attention just to, to summarize and to receive your faithful words of encouragement, Thank you for Elisha telling his 
servant and actually requesting from you, God, to open his servant's eyes. He's got to see what, what he, he's got to see what Elisha saw. And God, we just need to see what you see in our lives. That we wouldn't be so distracted and discouraged by the physical, but that our eyes would open to the spiritual. That we would flip the tables and see the spiritual far more than the physical. That we would stop living at such a low level of the flesh, demanding our ways and our rights, and in any way somehow demanding anything from you. But God, you allow these circumstances in our lives so that we might cry out for help because every time we cry out for help, you give it to us. And I just pray for those, as I think Pastor Ian mentioned earlier, just praying for those going through stuff tonight. Everyone has a story. Everyone has a difficulty. Everyone has a trial. Would you just manifest yourself, God, in the spiritual today? Would you just forgive us for settling for routine and ritual and shadows when we could have the substance that's all ours? Thank you for reminding us that he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. That we would fear you, God, more than any man because what can man do to us? That, God, we would diligently pray for our kids and our grandkids and our friends and our family that spiritual eyes would be open. That we wouldn't throw up our hands and give up, but rather we'd throw up our hands in prayer. That we would look to your faithfulness and we would acknowledge your faithfulness. We would receive from you your love and your mercy and your grace. That, Lord, for some that was just a word to get up, get back in the game, just serving you, loving you, ministering to the people in their lives. You've brought us thus far. And take us all the way through, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. We pray that you've been encouraged by this Bible study delivered live from the sanctuary of Calvary Aurora. For prayer or a copy of this study, call us at 877-30-GRACE. That's 877-304-7223. Or visit us online at calvaryaurora.org. Be blessed as you worship Jesus this week.